this session this afternoon is going to be in two parts. So the first part is going to go until 1.45 p.m. And it's going to be talking about tools in the toolbox for Apple crop load management. Uh, so yeah, let's let's get started with this. The second session, I should say, though, the, the second part is going to start at two o'clock and that's going to be uh, focused right on the uh, Orchard Tools app for iOS. So you're welcome to stick around for that and we might get a few others to join at that time, too. OK, so what can I teach you today? So, um, you know, you've obviously got your own comfort level with thinning, which is which is great. Um, your thinning program obviously works really well if uh, you know you're a commercial producer and you're growing apples profitably and uh, you, you've worked in hand thinning as well, which is, um, you know, great. Um, but, you know, there might be some some room to fine tune that thinning uh, each year. So nothing I say today should result in any major changes to your program because, you know, you've got that wisdom that, that you've accumulated over the years. But I'm just hoping to take a, a bit of a dive into the horticulture and the science there just to help you with fine tuning and, and any changes that you might like to make. But it doesn't mean we can't dream, you know, if, even if you just want to fine tune little things, we can still dream. There's going to be situations where we need to adapt to. So I'm, I'm hoping this presentation will be helpful in, in that sense. So like I said, we're going to be looking at the horticultural science of thinning today. So that's going to be looking at how your thinning approach relates to fruit and tree physiology, uh, how your chemical thinners are working, and uh, some of those tools to support your decision making that are relatively new out there and, and something you know you might not have tried or considered yet. So there's going to be a few different time periods we're going to focus in on. Uh, the first one is bud pruning, then uh, blossom thinning, then fruitlet thinning, and then hand thinning. Okay, so let's first start by honing in on those early thinning approaches, uh, because they have the most horticultural benefits. And this will explain, um, you know, part of the reason why. So this, uh, this figure here is showing um, the days after flowering, basically. And, uh, you know, if you focus in at the beginning here, this is the cell division phase uh, for those fruitlets. So it's a relatively short period. It happens the first three to four weeks um, after bloom. So um, cells are dividing, fruit are developing, um, and um, you know mostly that's how they're getting bigger at that point. And after that cell division phase ends, the number of cells in that fruit is set. There's gonna be no more cell division for the rest of the season. So that means if you wanna increase fruit size, you're relying on the, um, the cell expansion, um, the cell expansion for the rest of the season. So, um, you know, if you're looking at getting bigger fruit, then, um, you know, you might want to focus in more on that cell division phase because you could, you could set the potential for larger fruit for the rest of the season. You want to maximize the resources at that time. So basically any early thinning that you do there is going to allow more resources to be shared among the, rem the remaining fruit instead of having um, a lot of fruit competing um, during that cell division phase. Okay, so now I want to um, superimpose here the, the different periods of time that we can do crop load management and, and how that's relating to the, the fruit stages. So this really matters for small fruited varieties, especially in our climate where we really struggle to get um, size on uh, certain varieties like Gala, Ambrosia. And so uh, these earlier opportunities at thinning might be an approach just to get some more size. So you look at bud pruning, that happens um, you know, much sooner than the cell division phase. It tends to lead to larger fruit, increased cell number, of course, because you've helped to maximize the resources during, during cell division, and um, also some larger cells as well, but mostly that benefit is coming from the increased cell number. Then uh, if you move on to blossom thinning, you get the same benefits really as the bud pruning, um, you know, the increased cell number because you've done it uh, really early on uh, in the cell division phase. But it is a busy time, I recognize. Um, and also, you can get caught up in some fire blight warnings at this time, too. So it's not really one that you can rely on every year, but it, it could be a good approach in some years, just a little more variable. 
And then moving on to um, you know, the mid to the end of the cell division phase, there's the chemical thinning approach. So I see this kind of as a last chance approach to getting um, extra fruit size, extra cell division um, in your fruit. And um, it is still you know, definitely a, a recommended practice. Uh, chemical thinners are great in that they're strongly selective at removing the weak fruit. So uh, still a, a very good practice, just kind of getting a little close to the end of that cell division phase and can be used in combination with some of those earlier approaches too. Uh, then moving on to hand thinning, that's done after cell division, um, but there's still the potential for cell expansion, definitely. So um, just the thing is hand thinning isn't as selective as chemical thinning. So um, if you can hone in to your, your target fruit number with chemical thinning, you're gonna see more of those benefits um, to, to fruit size than you would see with hand thinning. Um, you know, you, you can still select what you think are the weakest fruits with hand thinning, but those chemical thinners, those plant growth regulators are much more selective at actually targeting the weakest fruitlets. Uh, so with hand thinning, you really only see the increased, um, you know, the cell expansion, increased cell size. And uh, just to note in like extreme situations, it's the fruit with the large cells that tend to be predisposed to storage disorders. So that's why I just like to encourage more of this increasing cell division compared to cell expansion if you're trying to get larger fruit size. So, I mean, I don't want to cast a negative light on hand thinning because it's still a very good practice for spacing out fruit clusters. It's just, um, you know, maybe we can take advantage of more of these earlier thinning approaches. And also uh, consider early thinning and biannual bearing varieties, of course. I mean, you've probably all heard this before, but um, the peak flower initiation is happening like in Honeycrisp around 45 days to 60 days after full bloom. So, um, you know, you've got the current year's crop, but then next year's crop is starting to initiate. And, um, you know, if you've got extra competition on the tree at this point, you're just um, you know, you could be have you're you're having a negative influence on your crop for next year in these biannual bearing varieties. So Honeycrisp is uh, quite an early one, and uh, Gala would be later on at about 85 to 95 days after full bloom. Um, this research was done in New York, so um, you know the timings might not be exact for Nova Scotia, but um, just the point that the, the relative differences in the varieties would stay the same because that would be like genetic to a certain variety. So in Nova Scotia, you know, we would still see the Honeycrisp being the earliest to initiate its flowers for next year and Gala being uh, later. So let's take a closer look at bud pruning then. Um, if you wanna to strive to start with bud, uh, bud pruning for some of those early benefits, um, I definitely support the idea of doing this. I think it's a great idea, but the thing is if we have the labor available uh, to do it, which you know we're going through a challenging time right now trying to get the labor in um, to be able to do it at this time of year. But um, I said we could dream for this presentation. So, so here I am with the dreaming. So um, some of the unique benefits of bud pruning um, is that you know, you're doing it early and then when you get to the chemical thinning period, you're more likely to get close to your target bud load um, you know, because you, you've already significantly reduced the bud load and then the chemical thinning is just gonna take some of those weaker fruitlets off at that time period. Uh, the other thing is if you, if you go into a season with excess flowers, like you have a snowball bloom, they can fail to set um, fruit very often. So it can be, it can always be pretty misleading because it looks like you're going to have a great, um, you know, fruit load. And then it ends up being pretty variable, like depending on the weather conditions, how many of those flowers are actually going to set. So if you reduce the, the flower load to begin with, um, it's going to be less variable. You're going to have stronger fruit there, more likely to set. Uh, also, uh, early bud pruning reduces the lost energy to bloom. Um, you know, you've taken off um, those buds. They're not going to put the energy into pollen development and flower development and so on. And also, maybe importantly now, um, bud pruning uh, at that time of year, um, you don't have to worry about reentry intervals if you haven't started spraying yet. So, 
um, you know, a lot of products are moving towards these longer reentry intervals, especially for hand thinning. So maybe, you know, if we can get the labor in, it would be really nice to start doing a little more of this bud pruning. Uh, could be an important strategy going forward. So if you do want to look at doing bud pruning, uh, how many buds on the tree are floral is, is a question that's going to come up because, um, you know, you don't want to prune too many of those buds off um, if maybe your floral percentage that year is on the low end. Um, you know, 20% one year, maybe compared to 80% another year, it's going to affect the number of buds you want to take off the tree. So um, this approach has been recommended. Um, it looks very cool if, uh, if you have the time to go and take some buds out of the orchard, um, do a cross section, and then uh, look under the microscope to see what you can find. So here, um, this is the leaf primordia. Um, you know, you can see it's a little straighter. It's going to develop into the new leaves compared to uh, if you can find a beautiful example like this, where the, the king flower is uh, visible here, and then there's lateral flowers coming out the sides. Um, and then here, this is a neat example where the king flower has died for whatever reason, and then there's two lateral flowers that are basically about the same size. So, I mean, it looks great, but how practical is this approach really? Um, you know, it's, it's quite difficult. These were my best example photos, and, and some of the other ones were quite unclear. So, um, you know, might not be the most practical approach. So there is a different approach that, that I do like here. So um, what you can do is sample some of the branches from the orchard and uh, you know from certain blocks and uh, take them from representative trees, take a couple um, examples and put them in water, put them in a warm place and let those buds push. Um, It'll take about one to two weeks before you can really tell. But so this is when this branch was first taken out of the orchard and then the branch here after it's pushed. So you can now see that the floral bud, floral bud, floral, uh, this one would be vegetative here. Uh, this is a close up, obviously floral and then vegetative here. So that's pretty cool. You know, if you have the one to two weeks to wait, um, it, it's definitely clear and uh, less time consuming. So from this, you can determine your floral bud percentage for certain blocks. Uh, you can use it to calculate the necessary bud load. So like you would start with how many, how many buds you want for a crop, then you would multiply it by that floral percentage. Um, and then you'd also put in a safety buffer so that just in case pollination is poor, you've got some extra buds there. So if you really want to go into that process, I did publish a new pruning publication this year, uh, building on our previous resource, but um, adding some of these newer techniques too. So um, yeah, uh, feel free to check that out. That's got the more of the process laid out for you. Okay, now moving on to blossom thinning with ATS. So that, that's also known as ammonium thiosulfate. thiosulfate. And uh, it has some drawbacks, but it also has good potential for payoff because it's again happening pretty early in that cell division phase. Uh, it's being promoted, I'm sure you've heard of it in some other regions like Michigan State as part of their thinning program. Uh, I've heard that there's interest increasing locally, um, of course, depending on the year and the weather conditions. But uh, what I want to do today is explain how it works uh, and how to um, think about reducing those inconsistent results that we've sometimes uh, seen in the past and maybe the reason for seeing those inconsistent results. So uh, what ATS does is it interferes with fertilization. So fertilization isn't uh, like a one, uh, you know, an instantaneous event, it's actually a process. So uh, this is the stigma of the flower here. And uh, what happens is a pollen grain lands on the stigma. Uh, maybe it's, you know, travels there through the wind or by bees. And then the pollen grain has to germinate and a pollen tube grows down the length of the style. So stigma, pollen tube grows down the length of the style and uh, gets to the ovary where fertilization happens. So um, it's a process, it takes time. It's not instantaneous, like I said. And so what ATS does is it's caustic to the stigma. So it, um, 
it, it makes that environment not conducive for the pollen grain to germinate. Um, that's similar to another product called lime sulfur. So I just want to bring lime sulfur into the conversation because there was a good research article here that, that gives us a good visual of how these caustic thinners actually work. So here, these fluorescent um, pieces that you see, they are um, pollen tubes and pollen grains that have been stained fluorescent. So uh, on the left here, this is a normal stigma. It hasn't been treated with any caustic thinners. You can see there's a lot of fluorescence because the, you know, there's a lot of pollen tubes developing. On the right here, this was treated with lime sulfur, which would be similar to ATS. And that caustic activity means that uh, there's not a lot of pollen to successful um, germination happening here. So that's pretty interesting, good visual there. And um, what's interesting about these caustic uh, blossom thinners is that their activity doesn't depend on the temperature at application. So, I mean, that could be an advantage because um, when you think about plant growth regulators, their activity actually depends on the temperature. So if you tend to have cooler conditions, um, you know, regardless, these caustic thinners are going to be caustic to the stigma. But the ATS application timing depends on the pollen tube growth rate. So indirectly, it does depend on temperature because um, the pollen tube growth rate depends on the temperature. So the temperature does affect the timing of the application, but like I said, it doesn't affect the activity of that, the caustic activity. So um, the goal with the ATS is to stop the fertilization of the unwanted flowers. So you wanna stop the pollen tube from reaching the ovary in the, like the rest of the unwanted flowers. So um, how would you know how long it takes a pollen tube to grow? So you measure the actual distance from the stigma to the ovary. And in this case, it's 12 millimeters. And research has shown that the pollen tube grows at a rate of 0 0.02 to 0 0.3 millimeters per hour, depending on the temperature and the variety. So, I mean, that just gives you an idea there um, of how the temperature can, af can affect the timing of the ATS application because warmer temperatures, uh, it's about 0.3 millimeters per hour and the cooler temperatures much, much slower than that. So uh, what you might decide to do with the ATS is, um, you know, maybe you wanna keep all of the king flowers after they're fully fertilized, but you want to use the ATS to, um, you know, burn the remaining uh, lateral flowers uh, so that they don't become fertilized. So traditionally, we've looked at an application timing of about 80 to 100% full bloom. And, um, you know, I kind of wonder if that's conservative because at that time, maybe the lateral flowers um, have already become fertilized, um, especially because that approach isn't taking the temperature into consideration. Um, but you know, if you're just using that timing, you probably do want to be on the conservative side. Um, but if you instead, um, you know, look at the temperature, um, you might be able to fine tune your approach is, is basically what I'm, what I'm getting at here. So um, uh, let's, let's move on then. So this is a good example of using ATS at different timings, um, depending on, um, yeah, so yeah, so a different timing. So here um, in, in A, figure A, what happened was um, it was a controlled experiment where the researchers pollinated these flowers and then 69 hours later, they put on the ATS application and they ended up with 100% fruit set because all of those flowers had the opportunity to be fertilized. Um, but this is where timing matters relative to, um, you know, the temperature, because if they pollinated and then 43 hours later, they put on the ATS application, there was only 33% fruit set um, because some of those flowers didn't have uh, the opportunity to be fertilized. And then uh, in a very extreme case, when uh, they pollinated those flowers and then four hours later, they put on the ATS, there was 0% fruit set. So. Um, yeah, they, the timing really matters with the ATS and um, 
you know, maybe if you're finding that that 80 to 100% um, full bloom timing is really only getting the very tail end of the lateral flowers, um, you know, we might be able to fine tune and apply that a bit sooner, um, depending on the kind of temperatures you're seeing to um, remove more of those flowers. So there is a pollen tube growth model um, that considers how the temperature affects the time to fertilization. And um, we, we don't have that model available locally, but the, the model is a good way of explaining how this works. So um, it calculates the, the pollen tube growth based on the hourly temperatures. So the kind of information you'd need to put into this model is the average length of the flower style. So from the stigma to the ovary, um, so that involves going into the orchard, taking those measurements and, and putting it into the, the, the model. And then you start the model when the target number of flowers are open, you assume that, that or you, know, you wanna say that there was good pollination conditions. So if all of your king blooms are open, you've had sunny, good weather for the bees to be around, then you would start the model. So that, that model is available for the US and I'm just gonna walk through how, how it works for them. So the model predicts when the pollen tube length has reached 100% of the style length. So here is when all of the flowers that I want to be fertilized are open. And then I start the model and um, the model predicts the growth of the pollen tube all the way to 100% um, of the, the length. So it's, it's basically fertilization of those flowers has happened. Anything that is opened after the fact would not have time to be fertilized. So by putting the ATS application on at that time, um, it would be removing flowers that have opened after the fact. So in this case, you're around 24 degrees Celsius. It takes two and a half days for that my target number of open blossoms um, <clears throat> to become fertilized. But in the case of around 13 degrees Celsius, which we can often see around bloom, bloom time, um, it would take five days after the target number of open blossoms for them to be fertilized. So, I mean, it really adjusts the timing. So, like I said, we don't have the pollen tube growth model available, um, but we can look at the US output um, because they do mention the temperatures that they're seeing um, and how it relates to the hourly uh, pollen tube growth. Um, so, I mean, it, it can give you a general sense of how quickly it's growing. Um, and e even just playing around with the model can give you a general sense. Um, basically, the point is, that, you know, that model hasn't been validated for us locally, but really neither has the 80 to 100% application timing because you know, the temperature varies every year and uh, it's, it's really going to affect this 80 to 100% application timing. And that could explain why we've seen some inconsistent results in the past. So, you know, you might be interested in using this tool in the context of your own experience um, and, and that, that is available. So there's definitely some challenges of using ATS. There, there's always a trade-off, even though we've got all of the, these uh, or some of these tools. Um, the thing with ATS is it's obviously a difficult application timing. It's not very forgiving, as you can see, like the successful flower fertilization can change, um, you know, it changes by the hour. So, um, you know, if, if you're in the middle of a rainstorm, when it's the ideal time to put an ATS application on, then, um, you know, it, it's probably not the best year um, where you're going to see the, the ideal results from it. Uh, the other thing is because it acts by being caustic, if some of the petals are um, protecting the stigma, then you're not getting the caustic activity on the stigma and those flowers are protected. And then um, afterwards when they bloom, then they can become fertilized. So you might get some tail end uh, bloom that would be able to get through that ATS application. Oh, it could also be an issue if you have um, the elevation in an orchard that changes so uh, that it's affecting the, the bloom date. So you can have um, like bloom starting uh, at different times and it, it's not very practical to put the ATS on. Uh, also, don't apply if temperatures exceed 27 degrees Celsius within uh, 24 hours. And you can also tend to see more burn if the leaves are wet during the application. 
Also, like I mentioned, it could end up being uh, around a high fire blight risk as well. So, um, you know, strep would be recommended beforehand and obviously that's the priority. So if you don't get the time to go in with the ATS, then, um, you know, it's, it's not very flexible in that sense. And it's also not recommended for young trees really, because if you want to defruit young trees, it would requ require a couple of ATS applications. And, um, you know, I just worry about the new growth on those trees just being a little more susceptible to um, uh, kind of the harshness of it. And it can also increase rusted on sensitive varieties. So, so be aware of that as well. So, um, you know, if you do want to try this approach on a small area, just be conservative. Um, you know, talk to some people who have experience about the rates. Um, just be conservative with the rates and use it on a small area first. But definitely, definitely if you do try it, um, keep some records and, um, you know, we can talk about it. You can learn from your results as well. And, and you know, you might become more comfortable, comfortable with the technique using it um, in the years where, where possible. So if you're really interested in learning more about this topic, I did have a discussion with Michael Baisdow uh, on the Orchard Outlook podcast. And that episode is called Don't Sneeze at Blossom Thinning. And uh, we had a really good conversation. He's doing research in New York. So he talked about um, kind of the advantages and disadvantages for them, um, what their growers think of it and, and how they're using it. So you can definitely learn more on the topic. Okay, now moving on to the fruitlet stage. So the, with the fruitlet stage, um, you know, it's a, we get to use plant growth regulators and it's quite complicated compared to ATS um, because the, the plant growth regulators are actually involved in coordinating the growth and development of cells. And so their activity is much more complicated in that sense, like regulating the, nat the natural processes in the tree. So their activity and their efficacy does depend on the weather conditions at application. Um, generally, the, the way they act is by um, causing stress on the fruitlets. And so the weaker fruitlets get outcompeted by the stronger fruitlets in the cluster. Um, so that's generally how they work. And so one way that we've been able to explain their activity is by thinking about the carbohydrate status of the tree. So, I mean, obviously during the day, trees are photosynthesizing, they're creating a lot of carbohydrates and they're also respiring. They're using some of those carbohydrates to fuel their, um, you know, their, their functions, their living functions. And then going into the night, photosynthesis stops and respiration becomes the main, um, main process in the tree using up those carbohydrates. So what happens on a sunny day is you get a lot of photosynthesis. And then in a, at a cool night, on the other hand, um, or on the same day, um, the, the tree is uh, slowing down its processes. Um, you know, it's still using sugars, but it's not using a lot of them. And so overall, there's an abundance of carbohydrates, not a lot of competition between those fruitlets. And um, it can end up being a difficult time to use those plant growth regulators because they're having difficulty causing stress to those fruitlets. But uh, on the other hand, if you end up with cloudy weather, then uh, there's not a lot of carbohydrates produced during the day. And then if that's paired with a warm night, then the tree's um, living functions are going very quickly. It's consuming a lot of carbohydrates and then you end up with carbohydrate stress. So um, very easy to cause competition between the fruitlets in that kind of situation. And um, the plant growth regulators tend to work very well in, in that case. And uh, we saw that last year when we had a heat wave uh, during, during our thinning period. And uh, at the plant growth reg regulators worked quite well in that case. So if you do wanna think about this uh, during thinning time, it's really the two days before and the four days after the thinner spray that determined the, uh, the plant growth regulator response. So, um, you know, really, really close to the application period, I would say is, is really the most important, but, um, you know, the forecast can change. So that can be challenging too. Like we didn't even 
really see the the extreme part of that heat wave coming. So, you know, you can get stuck with plant growth regulators being applied and then them having more of an effect than you expected. But, um, you know, just, just understanding this relationship can help with uh, uh, evaluating your thinning program and how it worked um, after you put it on. So we, we don't actually have access to the model, which helps, um, you know, instead of manually thinking about all these weather conditions, uh, they've kind of got it automated in the US with, um, you know, of course, some of their own um, input as well. But we don't have access to the model. Um, but, you know, if we think of it this way, we can still adjust the rates um, based on the weather that we see coming or the weather going into the thinning period. So the um, ideal temperatures for plant growth regulator activity are pretty moderate around 21 to 24 degrees Celsius. Uh, the weather's, you know, it, it's quite important to get the activity from these thinners. So, um, you know, we know that fruitlets are most sensitive during seven to 12 millimeters, but if you have to adjust your timing to apply between five and 18 millimeter of the king fruit diameter, then it, it's worth it to wait for those, um, you know, ideal temperature conditions if you can get them, because that way you know you're going to get the activity of those thinners. So, I mean, even on the label, there, there are some warnings about um, temperatures for these products and, uh, you know, making sure that it's warm enough when you're applying them and uh, being careful if it's too warm when you apply them. So definitely check the labels for these, uh, as always. And uh, now I think we should talk about some of these thinners. So they, they can be pretty finicky. So what, what do we actually know about them and, and how do they work? So we'll, we'll start with the, the really complicated one, Carbaryl. So uh, Carbaryl, the product seven, is a carbamate insecticide. So it wasn't even developed, developed for thinning, but um, you know, they noticed that it was causing thinning activity when it was being applied uh, around the fruitlet stage. So there has been research over the years trying to figure out how this product is working, and actually we still don't know. So uh, we know what it doesn't do. It doesn't affect the seed viability. It doesn't affect the ethylene production, which is like the ripening hormone, the maturity hormone, and it doesn't affect the photosynthesis. So um, you know, it's really unfortunate that we don't understand how this thinning activity is working because uh, if we ever lose access to this product, we won't be able to uh, replace it. So um, I'd be really curious to, to learn more about this. Um, what's great about this product and, and why it's quite popular is that it doesn't tend to over thin. So not even if there's an error in concentration because this product does become saturated in the solution. Um, so, you know, more product isn't going to cause more thinning. And um, you know, if you do apply that product and it's uh, undissolved and it remains active on the leaf surface, if you uh, come into some rewetting conditions like a drizzle, drizzly weather, it can be rewetted and it will tend to have more thinning activity from that rewetting. Okay, the next product is Fruitone L, um, also called acid uh, by people. And uh, what this product is doing is it's probably causing an increase in the ethylene production, or it's causing some cascade of events that is leading to um, higher ethylene readings, basically. So it's causing stress, it's causing increased maturity in the weaker fruitlets. Uh, with this product, the unabsorbed residue on the leaves, it um, is inactivated by sunlight. So right on the label, it does say to apply in slow drying conditions. Um, so, uh, you know, definitely take that into consideration if you want to get, um, you know, the, the benefit of that product applied in slow drying conditions, um, probably closer to the evening. And it tends to be a strong thinner, which can be quite quite helpful for some of those hard to thin varieties. It's rate responsive, so if you just want um, a little bit of thinning versus a lot of thinning, you can adjust that rate. Um, oh, also, it, it's quite useful in a combination with seven um, because it the two of them applied together seems to cause more stress to those fruitlets than applying them uh, individually at different timings. So it, it's kind of synergistic in that sense.
Okay, the next product is Maxell and Silas Plus. And they use the active ingredient 6-benzylatinine. And they seem to increase the resources going to the shoots uh, during uh, the period when they're applied. So it just causes more competition between the fruitlets because um, overall the fruitlets are getting uh, fewer resources and those stronger fruitlets tend to outcompete the weaker ones. Uh, so this is especially uh, useful in a situation where the carbohydrates are limited. Um, so during those uh, easier to thin conditions. And uh, also when this product is applied, it tends to increase the fruit size occasionally. So it, it does stimulate cell division above and beyond um, just the thinning effect. So, I mean, it's, only, it's around 20 grams per fruit though in, in a study on Empire. And if you were considering using it for the cell division purposes, it seems to be more effective when applied uh, later in the fruitlet stage at about 10 to 15 millimeter. Uh, so about 80% of the time there was um, more cell division. But when applied at the five millimeter timing, so earlier on, um, only about 25% of the time you get that extra cell division for, for whatever reason. And uh, pedophile treatments, there was no increase in fruit weight, no uh, additional cell division. So, uh, you know, we've only got a few of these chemical thinners, so there might be a case where you just want to boost the activity of your thinning combinations. So we did have a local study on Honeycrisp on M26 uh, using this approach. Um, and the reason for this, I mean, we had been hearing from a couple different regions that they used uh, mineral oil for this purpose. And, uh, you know, studies have shown that mineral oil uh, reduces the photosynthesis when it's applied. So causing an additional uh, carbohydrate stress on the tree, which would be expected to increase the thinning. So we looked at using uh, pure spray green oil at 1% and uh, did find that it strengthened the thinning efficacy when we combined it with seven or seven in Frutone or uh, seven in Maxell. We uh, actually did see some phytotoxicity with this uh, last year when we had that heat wave. It wasn't very uh, concerning though, because it was only like less than 5% uh, of the leaves were yellow and, and started to drop off. But um, you know, in that extreme situation, it, it wasn't too bad, which, which was uh, good to test. And um, anyway, at the conclusion of this research, it showed that uh, the product was making the fruit size um, trend towards larger sizes and also um, you know, because of that less fruit set. So, so it was um, augmenting the thinning activity. Okay, so we also might have some new products on the horizon, which is pretty exciting because I mean, we don't often get um, you know, this, these kind of additional tools. So right now, Metametron uh, is being um, investigated. And what it does is it's a photosynthesis inhibitor. So um, from what I've seen, it increases thinning activity, uh, which is great. We've done some local studies on Honeycrisp with M9, um, funded by the Fruit Growers Association. And also Adama, the company looking to register the product, has been doing uh, local trials and, and other trials as well. So um, it's been good to get some experience with this product. I uh, didn't see any phytotoxicity um, from, from what I've seen applied. Uh, Dr. John Klein in Ontario, he's been doing some research on it as well, showing some thinning activity and that it's concentration dependent. So uh, like Frutone, there's going to be a range of rates that you can use depending on what kind of thinning activity uh, you'd like to see. Uh, it is important to note that high temperatures would increase thinning activity because of, uh, you know, it makes sense with uh, inhibiting photosynthesis and causing that carbohydrate stress. So it, hotter conditions are just causing that um, additional stress. So, I mean, it's not going to be a silver bullet, but it's another tool um, that we might have registered hopefully soon. And uh, it'll be another, another thing to consider in the thinning program. And also just want to mention ACC. It's another product that, or another compound that's being registered. And it's a precursor to ethylene. So um, again, it can cause some, some stress among the fruitlets. 
Um, but uh, we will we will see how that one turns out as well. But hopefully, hopefully another option as well. Okay, so we've got these products. How much thinning is actually needed, though? So I mean, you can go out there during the fruitlet thinning period. You can check on these fruitlets, find out which ones have their sepals bending back, their stems turning yellow. I mean, you can be fairly confident that those are going to fall off. You can think about the weather conditions. Uh, you can think about the crop load, how that's affecting thinning. But really, all of these are subjective and competing variables, and it's, uh, it's pretty easy to get confused and, and unsure which one is more important than another. So I mean, some people prefer data to um, get some feedback on their decision making. So this is where the fruit growth rate model comes into play, and uh, it's been promoted more lately, um, uh, you know, at some recent events. And um, so basically, the model is called the predicting fruit set model, and it evaluates the ongoing fruit set. So uh, it involves measuring the fruit diameter, seeing, um, you know, how many fruitlets are going, growing quickly and how many are growing slowly because um, the ones that are growing quickly are certainly going to stay on the tree. And if they're growing slowly, you know, it's a good predictor that those are going to fall off of the tree. Um, so, you know, actually measuring that, uh, it allows you to make quicker decisions because it's predicting which ones are going to fall off. And it's kind of like a crystal ball into the future. You don't have to wait for those fruitlets to fall off the tree and miss your thinning window, basically. So it's a real time evaluation of your chemical thinning. Um, you know, buying you time to, to use chemical thinning again if you find that your first approach didn't work well enough. So like I said, you do need some data to plug into this model. So, um, you know, you'd be looking at your high value fruit to monitor their diameter over time. Um, it means selecting some representative trees and actually flagging some clusters. Uh, numbering the clusters, numbering the trees, and then within the cluster, just grabbing a permanent marker and, and labeling them one to five. And uh, then what you do is you put your chemical thinner on and you take your first measurement about four days after a thinning application. No earlier than the six millimeter stage, though. It's, it's too um, unreliable earlier than that. Um, but you know, you would start your, your fruitlet thinning around this stage anyway, and then what you do is you um, continue to measure the fruit size every three to four days. I've heard that four days is, is more reliable so that you're not accidentally wasting your time a bit too early there. Um, so, uh, you know, you put your thinner on, you measure four days later, and there you go, you've got some feedback on your chemical thinner application. Uh, some people label their clusters with um, spray painted clothespins. So um, just saw this during IFTA in 2020. So I thought that that was a neat idea to share there. So I, you know, it sounds time consuming. It certainly is if you're going to be bringing um, a spreadsheet to the field and, and recording that data. Um, it's a trade off, you know, if you want feedback on what you're doing, then then it's going to take some time to um, gather that information. Um, so we at Perennia decided to develop this iPhone app to hopefully make it more efficient and hope that more people will try doing this if there's an easier way to do it. So you can skip the clipboard. Um, there's the option to use this handheld phone. Um, just keep it in your back pocket. When you remember you want to go take a measurement, um, there it is, plug it in, and you're good to go. So I'm not going to talk about this too much because it's going to be the focus of the next session um, starting at around two o'clock. So you might wonder if it's worthwhile to assess the response to chemical thinning. Um, I would ask that without the feedback, um, are you chemical thinning enough? Are you taking enough advantage of that opportunity? Or are you losing money to hand thinning? Are you leaving a lot of the fruit there for hand thinning? A very time consuming process. Um, you know, if, if you're not getting feedback, how are you confident to apply a thinner at seven millimeter and then reapply at 10 to 13 millimeter? How do you know that you've seen the response to that thinner yet? Um, 
are you gonna have time before 18 to 20 millimeter? So I, I like the idea of getting that feedback if possible. So, you know, if you have time, you can try monitoring the growth rate, like I've explained. Um, you know, maybe this year, just kind of ease into it, flag five clusters, just get a feel for the process. Um, you know, don't use it to make decisions because five clusters isn't enough, but uh, just get a digital caliper, take a few minutes every four days, maybe you'll love it, maybe you'll hate it, <laughs> but at least you tried, right? So, um, uh, so that's what I'd recommend, just, just get a feel for the process, just ease into it. Um, because hand thinning, now that's a time consuming process. <laughs> So in the end, chemical thinning is never perfect. Um, you know, you're still gonna have to follow up with hand thinning to get the detail work, to space those clusters out. Um, but if you can do a lot of the work in the chemical thinning phase and get close to your target, then, then you're gonna be saving time. Um, you know, we did hear at a recent workshop that the people are gonna be preoccupi preoccupied with their fungicide program this year, of course, because there's a lot of changes going on there. So I certainly don't wanna overcomplicate things. Like don't, don't take this on if you don't feel comfortable doing it. But if you're interested in some of today's ideas, then um, you know, those are available to you if, if you feel you have the time to try it. So just a few quick takeaway messages then. We went over a lot today. So, um, you know, you know your thinning program, the science that we talked about today can help you fine tune it. Okay, I'm not, not suggesting major changes to something that you know already works. Uh, early thinning is helpful though, uh, especially in our climate with small fruited varieties. If you wanna get more cell division, you can get larger fruit uh, in that way. Uh, blossom thinners, they work at cold temperatures, which is pretty cool if you can get the uh, ideal timing of application for them, whereas uh, plant growth regulators don't work well at cold temperatures. We've had some recent difficulties with labor and uh, some longer uh, re-entry intervals for hand thinning, so that might encourage us to try some of these earlier attempts at thinning. And um, you know, we can work to remove some of the variability of the thinning process just if we can start to get some feedback um, and evaluate how the, the thinning is actually working. <laughs>